Hi, I'm Jim Heavey from Wood Magazine. If your shop is anything like mine, your table saw takes center stage. In this video, we're going to show you how jigs and fixtures can greatly increase the accuracy and the versatility of this workhorse. Well, any discussion about a table saw really should start with some checks and alignments. And the first thing is to make sure that your blade is at 90 degrees to the table. To do that, I just use a machinist square and check real quickly to make sure that that's the case. I can also use a plastic angle like this and tilt the blade at 45 to make sure that that stop is set too. If either of those stops does not allow for 90 degrees or 45, check your owner's manual to see how to adjust them. The second thing is to make sure that your fence is parallel to the blade. One of the easiest ways to do that is just take an adjustable square. You can set it in the groove, which is already parallel to the blade, and slide the fence until it just touches the edge of that square, and check here and at the other end to make sure that that alignment is exactly right. If it's not, again, check your owner's manual. The adjustments on this fence are just behind the edge that will adjust it either way. The last thing to do is to check and make sure that your miter gauge is at 90 degrees to the blade. Again, with the plastic square, slide the miter gauge up and check the alignment here and here and make sure that we're at 90. You can also do the same thing at 45 degrees and make that same alignment. And once you've gotten it correct, make sure that you readjust the cursor. Now you're all set to go. I'm gonna use a variety of materials to build these jigs and templates. The first one is MDF, or medium density fiberboard. It's a paper-based type product, extremely strong, very dense, and nice and flat. I like to use it on jigs that will contact or may contact the saw blades because this won't dull saw blades. The nice part about it is that it's a great material to use for jigs, the bad part is that it has an awful lot of sawdust that comes when you cut it. So make sure that your vacuum control is set up well. Second material is multiply plywood. You may have heard it referred to as Baltic birch or maybe Finnish birch. What's interesting about this plywood is it's got 13 plies that make up this three quarter inch thickness. Even good plywood only has five. These 13 plies add an awful lot more density. They also keep the board really flat with no voids. I really like using this stuff. It comes from about quarter of inch up to three quarters of an inch. The third product is hardboard or masonite. I find it works very well for jigs, especially when I've got the toilet bowl bolts underneath that have to have something durable to pull up against. It's a great material. It's available in stores and usually two by four foot sizes. It's available from eighth up to about quarter of an inch. And the last material is plexiglass or acrylic. I like using this especially on jigs with routers uh, because you'll find that you can see what the bit is doing. But on table saws, I can put this on the top to act as kind of a guard and I can see through and see what the blade is doing without worrying about getting anything in my eyes. Um, this is available in eighth of an inch and up to quarter. You can find it in a lot of glass supply houses and also at the big box stores. Um, those are the materials I've got to, to use. And I, what I found is that I like to take my jigs and templates and, and base them around must-haves and nice-to-haves. So the first thing we're going to start out with is the must-haves, and we're going to start working on this zero-clearance insert. As a woodworker, you're very familiar with the throat plate that comes with your table saw. These have a fairly big opening in the center of them, which allows the saw blade to cut at either 90 degrees or tilt all the way down to 45 without contacting the plate, and that's a good thing. Usually, you're doing all of your cutting with the blade set at 90 degrees, which makes this opening too big for the table saw blade. The problem there is as the blade cuts through this, what's going to happen is it's going to leave chip out on your high grade plywoods and also on your more brittle hardwoods. So what we want to do is replace this throat plate with what you see in the saw right now, and that's a zero clearance insert. A couple of ways to do that. One is to look at the commercial aftermarket business, and, and you'll find some of these that are made for your saw. Just need to know the manufacturer of your saw. This one's made out of ultra high molecular weight or UHMW. It's got a uh, splitter in it already. But the material I really like to use for this is this multiply plywood we talked about a little bit earlier. This is half inch. It's the same thickness as the throat plate that you're replacing. And all you do to make these is use your existing throat plate as a template, trace the outlines and cut them on the table saw and band saw and sand them to size, slide them into the opening, slide your fence over the top and just crank that spinning blade up and then back down again. The groove that's cut in there will be exactly the width of the table saw blade and you'll get no chip out anymore and it's a lot safer. You won't find pieces of material getting stuck between the blade and the saw. You won't find pieces shoot into the bottom of the table. It works really well. 
One of the problems you're going to find, though, is that when you insert this piece of plywood that you've cut into the table saw to make that first cut, it's not going to fit down into the saw. And that's because none of these table saw blades go much deeper than a quarter of an inch into the table. They never had to because they were going through a very thin piece of metal that was already cut for them. So a couple options. You can route a groove down the inside to allow a little bit more clearance so that you can get the plate in there and then crank the blade up. But I found it's a lot easier. Just replace your 10-inch table saw blade with an 8-inch dado blade. Do the same operation, crank that blade up and down through it, then swap those blades back out to put your 10-inch blade back in there and you're set to go. Make one of these for every cut you're planning on making. If you're using different size dado blades, make more of these. If you're doing it on an angle, make more still and with a magic marker mark them. You'll find you'll use them all the time. It's a great way to improve the accuracy of your cut and keep any of that chip out from happening. Now to provide the leveling for this plate, all you need to do is use the same screws that came from your existing throat plate, although I would suggest that you buy new ones. They're available at all hardware stores. There's really no need to tap these holes. Just drill four holes. Use an Allen wrench to drive those screws in there until the nibs protrude from the other side. Making adjustments there will provide a perfectly flat plate, very much like the throat plate that you had. The next must-have is dealing with your miter gauge. Now the standard miter gauge that comes with your saw is generally a little bit too small to do anything with. It's hard to grip on here, smaller pieces are very problematic to cut, and most importantly, the distance between the edge of that miter gauge and the blade is so broad that any time that you cut anything, there's normally chip out on the back side. What I'm going to suggest you do is provide an extension for this. This is how I did it. Here's a miter gauge I, I decided to modify. What I did is I used a piece of MDF, three-quarter inch MDF, and I cut a slot down the back side that matches up to the holes in your miter gauge. Now, if your miter gauge doesn't have holes, then drill a couple in there. What I found is that I can insert a toilet bowl bolt through that T-slot, and adjusting that onto the back of the fence provides a really great extension. To cut that slot, I used either a T-slot bit, or in this case, a keyhole bit. Now, sometimes a keyhole bit won't cut quite a wide enough groove to be able to allow that bolt to slide through there. So make your first pass in the router table, then come back at it a second time until that bolt slides easily. Once you've tightened these nuts, you can adjust that fence all the way over the top of the blade so that either cutting at 90 degrees or 45 will be fully supported. Cutting small pieces is very easy to do. We've also designed a small little stop block that will allow you to cut multiple pieces the same size. And as this piece of MDF wears out, just slide it over a little bit to a nice fresh piece. And remember again, this is MDF, so it's not going to hurt your saw blades at all. It's a great add-on to your miter gauge. Another great add-on, a real must-have for your saw, is a sacrificial fence. You really do have to protect your fence when using a dado blade and rabbiting on the table saw. You can buy commercial units, but I found that this one made of MDF works just great. It's a couple of pieces of three-quarter inch MDF spaced out by a few blocks of hardwood. This has been glued and screwed together, and now I clamped it to a flat surface so that after the, the clamps are removed, this is a perfectly parallel sacrificial fence. I left the screws out of the center part of this because that's where the saw blade is going to contact it. And the openings in here allow me to take a couple of clamps like this and attach it to my existing fence. Real easy way to do it. Once you've attached it, you're going to find that after a while, the side of this is going to be really beat up and all cut up by the dado blades that you're using. And ultimately, you may have to measure between that blade and the face of that fence to do some operation, and it's really hard with all of those saw marks in there. So the nice part here is that because this is parallel, you can flip it to the clean side, make whatever measurements you're going to make between the blade and this fence, and once you've gotten them, flip it back to the dirty side and reclamp it. Now another thing is, don't make this fence real tall. You have to make sure that the clamps that you have can slide through the openings here and attach low enough so that you're not making this fence just a little bit tippy. You'll also find that this fence sits flat on the table, so very thin material will glide past the face of this and not slide underneath the fence like they sometimes do with your existing one. Lastly, make two of these. Make one the length of your table saw fence and use that for daily work. But make one a couple of feet longer. 
When this is clamped into place and you put a piece of plywood on here, you have a much bigger area to start that plywood before you go over the blade than you would have had you been using your existing fence with just this last little foot. This is a great add-on. It works really well. And again, out of MDF, you don't have to worry about your table saw blades contacting it because nothing will get hurt. Now the last of our must-haves is some kind of an off-feed table for your table saw. I found it's really nice, especially with longer or wider material, as you're cutting them, they have some place to support them as they come off the saw. And in this case, what we've done is we built what's called a three-in-one work support. On this particular one, especially used with the table saw, we have a series of ball bearings. It allows for a nice easy glide off the back of the saw. There's a second part of this three-in-one support it is made with UHMW, ultra high molecular weight. Great way to position things, maybe off a drill press. And the last way to hold your work is with a nice broad flat table like this. And they all work the same way. There are a series of runners on the bottom that connect this to the basic stand. And I want to show you how that works. Now removing the knobs on both sides you can see the extension. This has got a hole in it, which of course line up to the three different tops. So swapping these out is really fast. Making the height elevation is done on the side with a small little knob and nut that run in a T-track. It's a great way to very quickly raise this for a table saw or raise it even higher for a drill press. The one thing I will tell you though is that when I cut this opening on the router table for the T-track, I was a little bit concerned about messing up this original piece. So I was glad that I made an extension a little bit longer and cut off that piece so that I can take the router bit and use this scrap piece to be able to lay out the perfect spot for the extension. It works really well. You'll use this in your shop all the time and between those three pieces, you'll never be without some kind of support. And one last tip. When I was gluing these runners to the platform here and the other two, I found out the glue made things kind of loose and they moved all over the place. It was really hard to keep them aligned. So I made a couple of brackets, little blocks on both sides that helped me center this a whole lot easier. I clamped those in place so that when I inverted this to put them on the tops of these runners, it stayed in the same spot. When you're clamping this too, you may not have clamps that are broad enough to be able to clamp each one of these little runners down to the side. All I did was make a couple of calls like this. So clamping it from the outside, put pressure on these runners and really did a great job of gluing this to the top. Follow these couple little tips when you're gluing it, and it'll save an awful lot of frustration. Well, we've showed you the must-haves, and now it's time to move on to the nice-to-haves. This first jig is called a raised panel jig. It allows you to do raised panels on your table saw without the need for a router or router table. And the construction is fairly straightforward. We've used 3 quarter inch MDF, a larger piece in the bottom, and a vertical piece here to support that board. The bar in the front is a clamping bar. It's got a real slight call or bow to it that allows a little bit of pressure to be placed in the center of that panel, keeping it a lot more stable. Small piece of sandpaper on the face of this that keeps that board a little bit more stable on the front of this. And finally, it runs in a runner. And then that runner runs into the track on the right side of the blade. The basic plans for this will tell you how to construct it. But the one important part for your saw is to make sure that the runner fits in your groove. And all the grooves are a little bit different. So when you cut one, make sure that it fits in that groove nicely. It does not stick in there, but does not have any side play in it. It'll allow this to run a lot smoother. The last thing is, the gussets that are in the back of this help maintain the pressure against the front of this to keep that face nice and flat. But they don't always guarantee square. So make sure that when you're doing the glue up here, provide some kind of clamping brackets that will attach to this with clamps that will hold this at square or 90 degrees so that when the glue up is done, you're sure that it's at a perfect 90 degrees to the table. That's how this jig works. Let me show you by actually doing a raised panel. Now I've set the saw up to cut a two inch groove all the way around the face part of this panel. That's how we get started doing a raised panel. So we'll do that first. Here's the start. 
of our raised panel. You notice the grooves all the way around. Now it's time to put the jig in. We're gonna set the saw blade to an angle and we're gonna cut all of the raised panels on this. Now I've assembled this panel good face out and set the blade at about 15 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is pass this panel in front of it and rotate and do all four sides. You'll see how the cut comes out and you'll have a beautiful raised panel. There you go, beautiful raised panel. A Little bit of sanding around the edges and you got it. What an easy way to do raised panels on your table saw with this raised panel jig. This is a 90 degree cross cut sled. It allows you to cut material as wide as 16 inches extremely accurately on your table saw. The component parts of this from the plans are, are fairly universal and you can make them up to look just like this. The key is how you adapt this then to work on your saw. So the first thing we have to do is provide the two runners that this will run in. The grooves on the saws are almost all the same. They are 3 eighths thick and 3 quarter inches wide, but they do have some slight variances. So make these runners to fit in your saw so that they don't bind, but at the same time slide nicely in the grooves. So once we've got those two, I want to attach the top to those runners. Now because I cut these a little bit thin, I want them slightly below the opening, one of the ways to help make that alignment is by just using a couple of pennies. So I'll put a couple of pennies in the groove first, like this. These will then sit just a little bit higher. So now it allows me to set the top onto these runners. The other very important thing is to make sure that your fence is perfectly aligned with these grooves. You don't want any variances here because this is how we're actually going to set this sled and that's what's going to maintain its accuracy. I'm going to put a couple of pieces of double stick tape on here, set the top on those runners which will help to fix it, and then I'll mount them permanently with a couple of screws. Now I've attached the runners to the sled. The idea now is to raise the saw blade and make one cut from the back all the way through to the front. Now that I've got that saw line through the base of this jig, I'm gonna measure four inches over from the end of that kerf and put a small mark at the bottom of this jig and then extend that line up the back side. That's gonna help me space this spacer block. Now to finish this jig up, we're just gonna apply this tape measure. This has a self-adhesive backing. I'll pull the backer off to adhere it. And then the last thing is to put in this small piece of acrylic. I've scored a line on there that I've kind of made a little cursor with. That adjusts to the block at now that four inch mark. And in a minute, you're gonna see how to use this jig to cut a nice wide piece of material. This is a glue up we did a little bit earlier and it's fairly broad. You know how tough it is to try and square up one edge of this before you cut a whole bunch of pieces to size. Well, it's real easy with this kind of a jig. What I'm gonna do first is slide this in and square off one edge. And then let's just say we want 18 inch long pieces. I'll adjust the cursor to 18. I just slide them up and I can cut dozens of them exactly the same and perfectly square.
Now here is a board with nice, perfect 90 degree corners. Much, much easier to do than trying to do it on your miter gauge or maybe even up against your fence. This is a great jig. Now onto my favorite jig, and that's the taper jig. Not only because of its simplicity, it does great, great tapers, but it also does four-sided tapers, which can be a little bit tough with your standard tapering jig. We'll talk about that in a second. Generally, when you use one of these taper jigs, they all work about the same. You slide the fence up to the blade so that the jig just fits between the fence and the blade. Anything clamped to the outside of that, when it's cut off, provides that taper. Now let's talk a little bit about the construction here. This is relatively straightforward. The bottom is a piece of three-quarter inch multi-ply plywood. The top is a quarter inch hardboard. To put the T-slots in there, all we'll do is put a 5 8 dado blade, set 3 16 of an inch above the table, and cut dados in that plywood board in the spaces specified. Once we've cut all of those, we're going to glue this piece of quarter inch hardboard to the top of it. Once that's glued, switch your 5 8 dado blade to a quarter inch dado blade, and now provide centered cuts over the top. Now that gives you the T-slots. You either use toilet bowl bolts or regular hex head bolts, quarter 20 through those slots, and that's what holds these hold downs in place. Now a couple little tips when you're doing this. When you glue this piece of hardboard to the top of the plywood, make sure you clamp it to a known flat surface. By doing that, you assure a nice flat glue up when you're done. If you don't have clamps long enough to bridge this, I suggest making a series of calls. These can be placed across the top edge here. They have a slight little arch on the bottom of them. And when you clamp down, you'll put a little bit more pressure over the entire glue up. The second thing is, while the glue up is happening, my suggestion is cut some small thin strips and slide them in and out of those slots. That way you'll clear any of the glue up that may be dripping on the inside. It makes it a whole lot easier later to be able to put those bolts in there. Once you've done that, it's now time to make these little stop blocks. You'll notice in here that they're also three-quarter inch plywood and they have a small quarter inch groove down the bottom that rides in the dadoed slot that you put in. Great way to hold something together. Now one of the things I found when I put these together, the bolt that's going through there is quarter 20. The piece that's in here, the small little shim that's in here, is also quarter of an inch. And when using the drill press and drilling a hole through there, you have a real good chance of blowing the sides of that out. So what I did is I created a small little female block. So I cut a quarter inch dado in there. When that goes through the center, it holds that piece in line so that when the drill bit goes through there, it won't get a chance to blow out that small piece of quarter inch shim that's in the bottom. Actually works really well. These then ride in the slots. Each of them rides on that quarter 20 bolt and provides some great hold down power throughout the length of this jig. Now it may be a little bit easier as we talk about this jig to actually show you a taper. So what I'm going to do is show you a four-sided leg taper. When you think about it, cutting two sides of a leg is real easy. So you're cutting one edge and flipping the jig and cutting a second one. But when you cut a four-sided taper, the third cut and the fourth cut result in the taper being next to the hold downs and there's nothing to grip it to. Sometimes you have to use a shim to hold it. The beauty of this jig is at this end we have a small little pivot block and this pivot block has a quarter 20 bolt coming out of it. That will help index the end of that leg. I'll show you how this works. It couldn't be easier. I made up a small leg here, which I'd like to consider as a, a little table leg. What we've got at the top is a four inch shoulder. I'd like this to be the part that's not tapered. And it's gonna taper down the length of each one of these sides about a quarter of an inch. So to do that, I've marked the edges on each edge about a quarter of an inch in. You'll also notice that I put a hole in the center of this by doing cross lines and then drilling a quarter inch hole. It's this hole that's going to index into this small little screw at the end of our pivot block. Now the pivot block is going to adjust up or down or in or out so that what you'll get out of that is this little line laid out exactly on the quarter inch mark. These then are held in place at the top edge by our clamps, like this. So as I run this past the table saw blade, this is the part that is not going to be cut, and slowly but surely it'll taper down to that cut. And because it's indexing against this little hole at this end, what I'm going to do is pull it off, flip it, and put it in again. And even after I start working into the tapers, it's still going to be indexed off this same edge.
There's one more thing I want to add. When you look at a table leg, you want to make sure that the tapers on all of these are always ending up on the same four sides. So to do that, each one of these blocks is adjusted so that it always indexes in the same spot. But what makes it really nice on this jig is a small little quarter inch nut. It's a little nylon nut. Once I've adjusted this block right up against the edge of the shoulder, so I know it's always going to be in the same place, all I do is take a wrench and tighten down that nut. So even after I've loosened the clamp, this stop is not going to move. It allows me each time to be able to slide that piece in and taper it. I'll get a perfect line across the top and I'll get a beautiful taper down the side. Here's how it's done. Now what you'll notice here is that as we flip this leg, the second and the third and the fourth time, a taper began to show up against the bottom edge. And because of this pivot block, we wouldn't have had any other way to clamp that, but the pivot block holds it in that same position. So on each side, that taper is maintained. If you look on the inside edge of this, you'll notice that in this particular spot, the clamp itself in the back side here is only holding it down, but the little stop block has already lost its function because the taper is moving away. The top block, because of that little lock washer, that little lock nut on the top, is holding it up against that shoulder so that every cut is exactly the same. This is a great way to do a four-sided taper and a great jig to do it on. And one more thing. If you're doing a table with four legs, you have 16 setups to make if you were trying to do it with a standard taper jig. With this, once the pivot block and the stop block is set at the top, all 16 of those go very quickly. Now, can I give you one more tip? In most cases, the joinery between the top of this leg and the table is going to be through some kind of a mortise or maybe even a biscuit. Do yourself a favor and put that mortise in or put the biscuit slots in before you do the taper. Otherwise, you really won't enjoy the experience at the drill press or on your mortising table. Now, I told you this was a versatile jig. Here's another thing it can do. I found a piece of uh, pretty wild edge stock here in the shop, and I thought what I'd do is show you how this will also operate as a jointer. What I'm going to do is clamp this board, as you see, just so that a little bit of this edge of the board hangs over the outside edge. I've slid my clamps up, I've removed that pivot block in the front, and moved these clamps to a more appropriate spot. I clamp this down, I'm still going to adjust the fence to the table saw blade like we did before. When I run the jig through there, it's going to create a perfect jointed edge on that board by using a taper jig. Here's how you do it. And now here is our jointed edge. Beautiful, flat, straight jointed edge on a taper jig. What a great jig. All in all, you probably won't find a nicer jig. I guess that's why it's my favorite. Mortise and tenon joinery has always been the hallmark in quality furniture making. It's strong and it's invisible. And I've got a couple of jigs here that will make you an expert in no time. Now a couple of things to think about first. I would suggest that you follow the one-third rule. Whenever you're making mortises and tenons, I would suggest that the tenons themselves or the width of the mortises be one-third the thickness of the stock. So on three-quarter inch material, we're talking about a quarter inch tenon. The second thing is make sure that you mill all of your stock evenly before you start. And the third thing is, do all of your mortising first. It's much easier to create a tenon to fit the mortise than it is the reverse. Now let me show you these jigs one at a time. The first one is cutting the shoulders on this particular piece, and the second one will be cutting the cheeks. Let's do the shoulder cutting one first. The first of these two jigs is a shoulder cutting jig. This is a very easy jig to build. Uh, it's made for your particular saw. So what we have here first, is an adjustment with a couple of screws through the back that attach this jig to the fence. You'll see a support block sticking out of the back side of this. 
In the front, we have a stop block that allows me to adjust the length of the tenon. And finally, a small little shelf that's put over the top of the base that'll keep any fall off from getting stuck in the saw. What I did with this is, following the rule of thirds, I'm going to take my piece of stock and first I'm going to set my tenon length to inch and three-eighths. I just thought that was a nice length. And the second thing I'm going to do is set my blade about a quarter of an inch above that base plate. So what I'm doing is creating a quarter shoulder on one side, a quarter shoulder on the other side, which leaves a full quarter inch tenon behind. So the idea is this is going to slide up against the stop block and I'm going to run it over the blade and flip it four times to cut a perfect even shoulder all the way around. Here's how you do it. The shoulder cuts are done, nice, clean, and sharp, all thanks to that really nice shoulder cutting jig we used. It's now time to cut the cheeks, so we have to remove the material all the way around to do that. And there's a few different ways. Uh, the first is using a dado blade on your table saw. A lot of woodworkers do that. Second is to go to a band saw, cut the cheeks on the band saw. That leaves slight ripple lines, much like the dado blade does, that you have to sand out. The third way to do it brings us to the second one of our jigs, and this is the cheek cutting jig. It's a beauty. I want to show you a few things about it first, and then we'll actually cut the cheeks on this jig. This is made to fit your saw. In this case, what we've done is we've made the two outside pieces of wood here match exactly around your existing fence. It needs to be nice and tight, and it needs to sit flat on the tabletop, and we put a top over there to hold it. The second thing is we've attached this face along the front of it, and added a couple of small gussets on the back to hold that 90 degree. And again, make sure that it's at a perfect 90 degree when you set this up. And the last thing we've done is add a clamping block to the back side. The way that this jig works is I align it up against the blade and I put my piece of material on this face. We then use this little toggle clamp to hold it. This is passed over the blade and the cheeks are cut on both ends and then turned around and cut on both faces. It's a real easy, extremely stable jig. Um, I think you're going to like the way this works. Now in actual practice what you'd be doing is you'd be cutting this tenon and, and slowly getting it narrower and narrower until it finally fits the mortise that you pre-drilled in all of your pieces. And once you get this to where the width that you want and it fits nicely, because it's once it's set, you can cut all your tenons at the same time. So spend a little bit of time getting this to fit exactly right by moving your jig just a little bit. And once you've gotten it, you'll have a perfect setting for all of the tenons into all of the mortises you've created. Aren't these a nice set of boxes? And isn't this a good looking frame? One of the things you're going to notice on all of these is that we've done a little corner treatment. And we did it because the joints in these are miter joints. And by design, miter joints are just not that strong. So what we've done is we've inserted a spline in each one of those corners. It's really going to beef up that corner, but it's also going to add some decorative beauty. There's two very simple jigs that we've used to do it, and I'll show you how to do it. Actually, we'll cut a corner and show you how it's done. Now this spline jig is a height of frugality. Um, this is a found 2x4. I mean, you can pick these up almost anywhere and a small piece of uh, quarter-inch hardboard. All I've done in that is cut a V in the front of it. And to do that, set your table saw blade at 45, and on your miter gauge, run one pass on one side, flip it to the other side, and cut it again, and that creates the V. On the bottom side, I'm going to set this so that my cut line from the table saw blade is 3 8 of an inch from the edge of that cut line to the back of this hardboard. That way, with most three-quarter inch material, I'm putting that spline right down the middle. 
Uh, you can vary these depending upon what your interests are, but I'm going to start with it this way. Here's how this works. We're just going to run it on the table saw blade and cut a corner through a frame. You'll see how well it works. And here is a beautifully cut spline on the end of that board. Now you just saw the jig that cut a groove for that spline down the center of the frame. Very nice, very decorative, very supportive. Same type of operation was done here, but after we placed the splines in them, we actually cut down the sides of the box on an angle. Changes the whole look of things. Lastly, if you want to build a more supportive, a uh, little bit more beefier type jig, like this one, and angle your table saw blade at 15 degrees. By doing that, and running a box like this through it, what we found is that you're putting kind of like a diamond shape on these. It's a really nice look, adds just as much support, but a little bit more flash to it. There's a lot of ideas here. You can let your creativity kind of flow. But all these things have one thing in common. What we did is we cut the grooves in here. We still have to cut the splines to go in them. I've got a great jig to show you how to do that. Now the groove that I'm trying to fit in here is an eighth of an inch. That's normally because I like to use an eighth of an inch saw blade when I do it. This is the material I was thinking about using. It's a piece of walnut and the color contrast will look pretty nice. So the idea is to try and cut an eighth inch strip of this and make sure that it's perfect so it fits real nicely in that groove that when you sand it off will look real clean like it does here. A Couple of different ways to do that. The first is you can actually slide your fence up to within an eighth of the saw blade and make a cut like that. I'm not real fond of that. There's no real way to get a push stick in there to be able to push that piece through. You certainly can't hope that it will go through by pushing on the opposite side. The second way to do it is to use a scrap block of wood like this with a small foot on one end. Take your fence and slide it over to where that piece of scrap just touches the saw blade and in effect now that becomes your new zero. So on the fence in the back I can look and see whatever that, that, that number is. If I want to cut an eighth inch piece by looking at the fence and moving that an eighth of an inch, I will now expose an edge that's an eighth of an inch away from the blade and by putting my piece of wood in here, pass it forward and cut that off. It does work. One of the problems is, is that piece passes through the blade, there's no way to hold it in the back and that little vibration on there can leave some saw marks which may be tough to get off. The third way to do this and the one I would kind of suggest is with what's called a thin strip ripping gauge. Now we've had this around for a while and it works just great. The gist of it is, I have a small little ruler underneath this piece of plexiglass and a screw at the other end. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set this in the slot. I'm going to adjust my cursor to match zero on that gauge. And this little brass screw, I'm going to turn it in or back it off until it just touches a left facing tooth on my saw blade. So when this is set at zero, I know that the edge of this screw is exactly where that saw blade is going to cut. Now if I want to cut an eighth of an inch piece of material, all I need to do is move that cursor an eighth of an inch. So what I've done now is I've moved this screw head an eighth of an inch away from the saw blade. Here's the material that I want to cut. Using my fence as a gauge, I'm going to slide that until that piece of wood just touches that exposed screw head. And now what I've got is a piece of wood that will have an eighth inch left after I make the cut. It's a great way to do it. Let me run it through and I'll show you what I'm talking about. And here's my eighth inch piece of wood. It's also another way to add a decorative piece of wood to cover that piece of plywood edge, that exposed plywood edge on a cabinet you're working on. One of the nice parts about this is that all you're going to do is run your material up against the edge and the cutoff piece becomes the part that you glue to the end of the plywood. It's a perfect way to disguise it. If you try and make one of these jigs to cut a thin strip off and you're planning on covering an eight foot long piece of plywood on the edge, this block has to be eight feet long. In this case, by using the thin strip ripping gauge, it works just great. <laughs>
This is a piece of crown molding. You've probably seen this at a lot of the home improvement stores. And what's nice about crown molding is this very gentle little cove at both the top and the bottom of the molding. These are normally done at big factories with molding machines. But I'll bet you'd be surprised to find out that you can do that on your table saw. It's a very easy process and all you really need is a couple of pieces of scrap wood. This is the jig that I've made for this. At one end of this, I put a small hinge. And the back side extends like this with one edge being attached to the fence, the other side going diagonally across the top of the blade. And the swing arm helps provide a permanent attachment for that arm. All we're gonna do is take a piece of material and run it diagonally over that blade. And going diagonally, we're gonna begin to create that cove. Now I'll show you that cut in just a second, but I wanna give you a couple little tips first. The first is whenever you set up for a job like this, make sure that you use a piece of scrap for the same thickness and width to kind of determine where that cove is gonna go and you can make adjustments from there. The second thing is, whenever you're planning on doing any kind of custom trim, make sure that you make more than enough trim. You're gonna find that you'll never be able to recreate that trim if you go back and fix a mistake. So make it as long as you can, allow plenty of room for excess. And the third thing is, as you're cutting these, make the most minor of height adjustments. Every time you raise that blade, you only want a very slight increase because the smoothness of that cut depends on how little you're taking off at each time. It may seem a little bit more involved and take a little bit more time, but you'll really save time in the sanding aspect later. So here's how we do this. Now this may not be the cleanest of operations, even with the best of vacuum control, but you'll find that putting a cove on a board like this really opens up the possibilities of creating custom molding for your projects or for your home. It's a great jig, easy to put together and easy to use. Now I know that this may look like a lack of organizational skills, but it actually represents all the jigs we've shown you in this video. And you'll find even more jigs in Wood Magazine. In addition to those jigs and the ones that you've seen here, I'm sure you can create jigs of your own to help you in your workshop. You're going to find, like we have, that the addition of a few jigs can greatly increase the accuracy and the versatility of your table saw. Hopefully this will give you the enthusiasm to get back into that shop and work on that project you've been holding off on.